At the start of this, I'll point out that I do not work on parrots. I do work on marine mammals, but I'll try to draw some parallels between uh, these different groups. And I'll be discussing a much more fine-grained and process-oriented view of the origins of culture uh, than either Tim Wright or Hal Whitehead. I think it's very useful to have these different perspectives at the same time. I'd also like to second Jim Moore's call to broaden our comparative perspective to new species. Uh, I'd also I'd include, for example, animals like elephants as in this kind of category that uh, Susan mentioned earlier. Uh, my focus uh, is on vocal learning, uh, as Tim described, that's the capacity to learn to produce new sounds based on hearing the sounds of others. A vocal learning is essential for the components of culture that are expressed by vocal communication. Uh, since it's relatively rare among non-human primates, those who work with primates may be less familiar with it. But there are other groups of animals which show great skills in vocal learning. And some of the strongest evidence for vocal learning comes from reports to train captive animals to use artificial signals. I'll give an example. Alex, what matter? Meaning, what is it made of? Whoa, that's right. You're a good Alex animal. can answer different questions about the same object. Come on. How many corners? What shape? What shape? Four. Corner. Four corner. Good boy. Alex hasn't just learned to say a certain word when he sees Look a particular object. He's how paying many? attention to the questions. How many? Wow. That's right. You're a good boy. So there's an example where humans have asked the animal to adapt to our system. And we can get a sense of their capabilities, both of imitation and labeling. Uh, similar work was done by Lou Herman in the University of Hawaii and his colleagues in the 1980s, in which uh, they would uh, train a dolphin in captivity to imitate a computer-generated sound. So here is a spectrogram, or a plot of frequency against time, of a tone generated by a computer, woo, like that. And here's the dolphin's imitation. You can see the pattern is quite similar. Here's an unmodulated sound, lower in frequency, like whoop, and the dolphin can't make it perfect, but it's much less modulated. And here's a square wave, which the animal is a little rougher at. But you can see the animal is, is doing a pretty good job at Im imitating the sounds. And if you ask an observer to, to compare the, the imitation to the different models, they can easily uh, correctly classify them. <laughs> Uh, once uh, Doug Richards had done this training in Lou's lab, he realized what he could do is train an animal on a vocal labeling test. So for this computer-generated sound I showed you before, what they would do is when the dolphin had a ball in the pool, they'd put the ball in, the dolphin would be playing with the ball, and they would play this sound. So the animal learned to associate this sound with the ball, and this woo 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 sort of more rapidly oscillating call was associated in this case with a frisbee. Then for the test, after the training, what they could do is throw the ball in the water. And the job for the dolphin was to make the sound that had been associated with the ball. And if you threw the frisbee in the water, their job was to make the frisbee-like sound. And dolphins can do this exceedingly well with a, with a relatively small amount of training. So they're able to use an artificial man-made sound that they can produce themselves to label an arbitrary man-made object. Uh, and in general, these animal language experiments have demonstrated both interesting capabilities of imitation for vocal learning and of labeling. Uh, and I just said these, these topics. I don't think I need to say more about it, other than the lab is a useful setting to be able to demonstrate the imitation and vocal learning for sure with artificial signals. That's harder in uh, the wild. And it's, it is a, a relatively short-term learned tradition that participants can use to communicate across species. So in that sense, it's a shared animal and human culture. However, my bias, my training is in ethology. And my bias is, is that to understand the evolutionary origins of the skills, uh, we really need studies of animals in the wild of the sort that you heard from both Susan and Tim. So one question is, is there evidence for vocal learning in natural settings? The Indian hill mina is a bird that's quite an accomplished vocal mimic in, uh, the, in uh, captive settings. And the first studies of this bird in the wild provided very little evidence for vocal learning. So, so you really want to look at where does it occur. When you do find animals imitating sounds in the wild, what are the functions of vocal learning? 
How do animals use these skills in their own cultures and their own learned communication systems? And are there commonalities between species that have independently evolved vocal learning? Uh, Susan showed uh, her taxonomic chart. Y you could view this for a variety of these traits we're interested in. What are the commonalities among species that have com come up with these uh, unusual traits? The broader a taxonomic perspective, the more different uh, independent groups we have to look at, the better our analysis will be. And I think we're very limited if we, if we limit ourselves to primates. Uh, here's an example of uh, vocal labeling from untrained but captive uh, parrots. These are spectacled parrotlets uh, studied by Vanker in Germany. And what he did was he took recordings of parrotlets uh, when they were, uh, could see one other bird and only one other bird. So, but, uh, uh, and could, I'm uh, sorry, could, were in the same room as another bird, could not see, but could vocally communicate. So they could hear each other and not see each other. And what he found was that when the same individual, these are all spectrograms from the same individual, when this animal was communicating with its mate, it produced a call like, ooh, 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 like that. And here's another example of that same call. When it was communicating with one offspring, it, went, it made a sound like ooh, 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 like that, which is very similar down below. With another offspring, it made a different signal. So basically, he found that, each each, that when this individual bird was interacting with a specific other individual, it had an individual distinctive contact call that it could use for that specific individual. And the other individuals recognize when they're hearing the call that's specific for them. He discovered that from playback experiments. So that's quite similar from the vocal labeling experiments I showed that Lou Herman's group did with dolphins. The, the psychologists seemed obsessed by objects. What the animals are telling us is the natural labels are the names of social partners or social groups. That's the more common thing we're seeing from untrained animals. To now go into the wild, uh, to look at uh, some of the background of some of the animals in the wild, I'll be discussing another parrot that comes from the uh, dry forest around Guanacaste province in Costa Rica. This is the orange-fronted conure studied by Jack Bradbury's group. And the most uh, stable groups in, in this species are mated pairs. That's quite common across parrots and sibling groups. So the strongest and most stable group is the mated pair. And during the se breeding season, pairs depend, de defend their nests against many other parrots. So they, they have to rely on each other in this, in this somewhat risky defense. Uh, they'll lay up to five eggs in a nest, uh, one after another. And the, and the birds that, the, that hatch from these eggs form a sibling group that forages with the parents for a few months until they join other groups to form foraging groups of 10 to 20 birds. Among these foraging groups, though, each night, parrots of a couple different foraging groups will roost apparently in a different tree, according to the work of Bradbury's group. So what that suggests is that you have quite fluid groupings in the night roosts, very stable mated pair bonds, and intermediate stability in the foraging groups. So you have very, some very stable individual-specific social relationships within fluid groupings, where animals that share relationships need to depend on each other. Uh, within this, this species, these are four um, uh, contact calls from four different individual orange-fronted con uh, orange conures. And in this case, the overall gestalt of the calls may be somewhat similar. I hope it's obvious to everybody that, say, compared to the dialects that Tim showed, these are quite, each one of these is quite different. So this has an upsweep and two of these humps. This has an upsweep and one uh, hump here. This has two shorter humps. They're quite easy to distinguish. If we look at bottlenose dolphin societies, they also show strong bonds within fluid groups. The details are different. So it, it, uh, in dolphins groupings, they seem to have a fission fusion pattern of fluid groupings that change constantly, even on a minute by minute basis. There's no evidence for paternal care, but the young are dependent on the mother for three to five years. And as Susan mentioned, as males mature, they form quite strong bonds, associating almost all the time with one or two other males. And, and these male coalitions uh, rely on each other for very important cooperation. And within these fluid groupings in dolphins, the strongest bonds are between the mother and the young for a period of dependency of a few years, and male alliances that may last for decades. 
Here are some examples of contact calls used by dolphins. This is the very early figure by uh, David and Milba Caldwell from the 60s. Uh, these are from common dolphins, and these are uh, animals from captivity. Uh, when these animals were recorded, this, this is a, a, a call from one dolphin. It was like, ooh, and here's one from another one, ooh, like that. These calls are so distinctive that when you know the animal and you hear it, you immediately know who it is. Uh, it's uh, as easy to distinguish as species for songbirds that you know. Uh, on the other hand, it's quite hard to distinguish species. I couldn't tell you this was a common dolphin versus a uh, bottlenose dolphin. And if we look at the functions of when these uh, calls are used, they're called, uh, uh, often called uh, cohesion calls or contact calls. Uh, they're not used randomly to maintain contact during separation. This is a plot from a lot of focal follow data uh, looking at separations of animals from the start of a separation, however long it lasted, to the end, and from being together to as far away as the animals got. And the open circles mark random timing. The, the dark uh, circles mark actual times when the animals whistled. You'll see there are quite a very few whistles made during the time animals are separating. As soon as they start whistling, the animals stop separating. So they use this call to, to slow down the separation process, but they don't immediately come together. They don't have to immediately come together. They do continue calling during the time when they come back together again. And playback experiments show that dolphins in the wild, but in a rather artificial capture setting, uh, and uh, uh, parrots, respond preferentially to the animals they share strong bonds with. So in a matched kind of playback setting, if you play back the sound, the call of an animal that the animal has a strong bond with, it will show a stronger response to that than to a call from this, an animal of the same age sex class that it's not very closely related to. So they recognize these individually distinctive signals that look quite different. Uh, uh, we've heard a little bit about convergence of calls as animals form stable groups. And this is present also in both in different parrot groups and marine mammal groups. In Bajerigar, Bajerigars, Susan Farabaugh showed uh, that when males are caged, uh, when animals are caged together, in this case all males, uh, it, this is the same kind of plot of a spectrogram cross correlation uh, against multidimensional scaling that Tim showed. And the letter corresponds to each individual. So these are calls of one male, another male, another male before they're house together. They haven't heard each other. After eight uh, weeks of being caged together, here's an, here the animals have converged into three different converged call types. In dolphins, as males form an alliance over a period of one to three years, their signature whistles converge. Here's uh, one example of a, of a pair of uh, alliance partners here, and here's another pair of alliance partners. And this is actually quite this is a, the most common form of vocal learning we know of. This is the only example I'm aware of that's shown for non-human primates. So for, uh, th there are uh, some non-human primates that when caged together like this will show, show some evidence for vocal convergence as they form groups. So it's a rather widespread phenomenon, probably more so than the individual specific calls that I showed. When you look at playback experiments uh, for these kinds of uh, individually distinctive contact calls, uh, both in, in dolphins and in parrots, we're starting to see some quite interesting examples. So here's an example from Balsby and Bradbury from this year, in which the, uh, as, as a group of, as a parrot flew overhead, they would play one of these contact calls over and over again. And this is the um, uh, multidimensional scaling analysis of the spectrogram correlation for similarity of the stimulus against the responses of the bird as it's flying overhead. So it starts with a call that's pretty different from the stimulus. There's the stimulus. Here's its, the second response, which it seems pretty far away. And you can tell just looking at it, they're not very similar. But as it keeps, continues calling, it gets closer, moves away a little bit, then gets then bang on by the ninth call here. He gets one that's pretty similar to the stimulus call. And then it deviates away. And uh, Balsby and Bradbury found variation in the, in the responses of the animals of either converging or diverging in their response to these playbacks. Now, the playback's probably a little bit stupid. It's just the same call over and over. The parrots are probably much more sophisticated. And so we're just beginning to gain entry into what this means. 
And here's an example of vocal matching in wild dolphins, not from a playback experiment. This is from Vincent Yannick. He set up three hydrophones or underwater microphones in an area where dolphins were feeding. And here's a case where one dolphin was here, another dolphin was here, another dolphin was here. And this dolphin produced an upsweep, downsweep call. And with a time delay uh, that was very short, uh, so it, had, it couldn't have been produced by, this, by the same animal, a second animal, D D D2, produced the same whistle. And here's a third animal producing it. So we see similar kinds of immediate vocal matching in the wild, where we don't know exactly whose signature whistle is which, but we see vocal matching in interactions uh, among animals out of sight of one another. In captivity, when we look at animals uh, in isolation, we can identify their signature whistles when an an or individual distinctive contact calls. When these animals are isolated away from other animals, the d predominant call will be an individually distinctive call that's different from others. So here's data from two animals in captivity, Spray, who had a slow decline and slow increase in their signature whistle, and Scotty, who, who had much more rapid uh, modulation. And you can, here's a case of Scotty imitating Spray's call and Spray's imitating Scotty's call. What about the functions? What do these tell us about the functions of vocal matching? I'll say right now, we're at the point of hypotheses. We do not know the answers to these questions. But one qu question, one hypothesis, is does a, hypoth does a dolphin imitate the whistle of another individual to initiate a social interaction with that specific individual? Or in the case of the parrotlets, does the parrotlet make a particular individual, the, his own call for a particular individual to initiate an interaction? And in these groups of parrot exchanges, uh, the way these exchanges involve converging patterns and then diverging patterns suggests to Balsby and Bradbury that rather than just a simple cohesion effect, maybe these exchanges reflect a negotiation about whether to join. And so imagine you've got a, group, a, a small foraging group of these orange-fronted conures coming down. They're trying to decide who to join for a night roost. The night you choose your night roost to avoid predation. They're quite vulnerable to predators in these areas. You really have to depend on these other groups being reliable. We don't, we don't know now about what the content of the negotiation would be, but it's possible that these vocal exchanges during the daytime when it's safe to do it are sort of a pro probing of a negotiation about which groups they might want to roost with or not. And to close, I'd just like to suggest that, that we have very radically different patterns of vocal communication, particularly among mammals, but also among the different uh, bird groups that Tim mentioned, some with, some without vocal learning. Uh, there are closed systems of vocal communication that, that are predominate among most mammals. Most mammals have a fixed vocal repertoire of signals. The motor pattern for producing each vocalization is inherited. This is a very limited communication system compared to the kind of thing I've been describing. And there are some other kinds of animals, and, and dolphins, parrots uh, are only, I'm only using as a sort of an example of, um, of these groups. Sorry, there we go. Uh, dolphins and some birds maintain the ability to learn new vocalizations throughout the lifetime. Dolphins and avian, dolphin and avian vocal repertoires can be open and can differ between individuals. And we know at least from the captive work that dolphins and parrots can learn to associate novel reference with these novel learned vocalizations. Let's just suggest that these skills are critical for cultural exchanges that depend upon vocal communication. Thank you.